Yes. Say it with me. Yes. Let's say it again. Yes. And one more time. Yes. Now, was that so hard? Right. Yes. <laughs> In many senses, that is one of the most difficult things that we can say or do for ourselves is to say yes. I'm Daria Willis. I'm 31 years old, and I come to you from Atlanta, Georgia. Much of the introduction that you heard is the silver spot, that yes, she finally made it. When you look at me, do you see that she was an honor student? From high school through college, I had to work my way up to where I am today. So when I started in high school, um, I was the honor student. I had a 3.9 GPA from, uh, from high school. I left high school after 11th grade and went to college at Florida A&M. From there, I earned my bachelor's degree, magna cum laude, my master's degree in one year, and my PhD from Florida State in five years at the age of 26. At the age of 24, I earned my first full-time faculty position at a college in Texas. Then I would go later, like I said, and earn my PhD. A year later, at 25, I was one of 26 founding faculty who founded one whole institution by ourselves with one president, no deans, one VP, and 26 faculty members. Shortly thereafter, I walked my way into administration at the age of 27. I became a dean and went on and on and on to where I am today. But that story doesn't tell you who I really am and what I had to endure to get to this level. Like I said earlier, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia, and I grew up in a middle-class community in the suburbs of Atlanta, an area called Stone Mountain. Um, I had my mother, my, my father, my older brother, and it was nice, happy family. But if you ask me anything after the age of six, from probably about six to 12, I can't tell you much about my childhood because at the age of six, my father would die. At that point, I didn't know why he passed. It was in the, around 91, and I had no idea. The family it was just huge secret that I couldn't get. Even my mother wouldn't tell me. It wasn't until I reached college that she said, well, your father passed from HIV. Now, going from the age of six to probably 18 or 19 years old when I first learned that, that was a huge blow to someone at that point. But you learn to get through it, right? You learn to move forward. You can't dwell in the past. You have to go on. So probably when I hit about 12 years old, that's when life happens for me again. I entered the band. I was very active. I did a lot of things in high school. I was very active in middle school. And then I went to college. Well, college was interesting because I was there as an early admissions scholar. I entered with a presidential scholarship. I also um, was awarded a band scholarship, but that still didn't cover the rest of my tuition. Um, but within my second year of school, I had dropped my GPA from a 4.0 to a 2.6. I was pregnant. I didn't know what to do, and I was afraid to tell my mom. I was even more afraid to tell her that it wasn't the first time that I had become pregnant. The first time, I ended up having an abortion, and I remember being in the clinic that day, and the lady looked at me and said, girls like you always come in here. You'll be back. Imagine someone saying that to you. I didn't come back. So after I had my daughter, at 20 years old, it was finally at that moment, at 20 years old, when I looked at my daughter and I said, I never wanted her to look at me, and I was nothing. I never wanted her to look at her mother and say that she didn't contribute anything to society. So at that moment, I had to learn to have the courage to say yes. Yes to myself. Yes to getting my act together. Yes to investing in who I wanted to be and to wanting more for myself. So. What did I do? I didn't do anything. I sat back, tried to figure it out, and finally, 
progress back through school. So I started taking all kinds of classes, 21 hours here, 21 hours there. And by my third year, I graduated. But I had a BA in history. What do you do with that? Nothing. I tell you now, if you want to get a BA in the liberal arts and you don't want to get a graduate degree, you'll learn very quickly that there are not many job opportunities out there. But at that time, I did something a little silly as well. So I felt that since I was pregnant, I had to get married to the guy, right? Because you want that big happy family, the white picket fence. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do that either. That was the worst decision that I could have ever made because it was a constant battle between the two of us on what direction my life was going to take. While he felt that I should have just gotten my bachelor's degree and go off and be a school teacher because we need the money. Remember when I said that when I looked at my daughter the day she was born, I wanted her to see me as being something more, doing something different and creating my own path. So while he told me no, I said yes. So I had this professor who believed in me. After I got my bachelor's, I went back to Atlanta. I stayed with my mom, and if you've ever lived with your parents, I wouldn't recommend it. We love each other dearly, but I still wouldn't recommend it. So he called me up one day and he said, Daria, what are you doing? Uh, I said, I'm working as a reader scorer at Pearson. And if you've ever done that, you sit in a room with all these computers, and from 9 to 5, you read essays that students wrote to pass some standardized e exam. Now I'm a college graduate. I was making $8 an hour doing that and really ashamed of myself. So he called and said, we have this new program. It's the summer program. We get you through in a year, and I've got money. All I need you to do is come back. So what did I do? Got in my car, packed up my daughter, drove back to Tallahassee, Florida. I matriculated through Florida A&M for a year. And then I said, well, shoot, what am I supposed to do now? I have a master's degree in history still sitting here with no options, nowhere to go. Then there was someone else that came along. She was the dean of graduate studies at the time. They had just come up with, state of Florida had just come up with this new program that gave money to students of color to help them go off to be doctors, lawyers, or whatever they wanted to be. She fought for me to get the scholarship to go to another institution across the street. She called me in her office one day. I was her intern. I did some research for her. And she said, well, what is it that you're going to do now that you have your master's? And I said, well, no, I guess I'll find a job. I'm definitely not going back home to live with my mom, so I've got to do something. Because I had my daughter at the time, still had no clue of what I wanted to do. So she said, hey, I've got this scholarship for you. Why don't you go do that? So I became the career student. It wasn't in my path. I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't know what a PhD was. But I said, well, if you give me money to do it, why not? And you have all been in that situation before? They say, here's some money. OK, I'll take that. And here I was on my way to Florida State. Didn't know what it was about. Didn't know what I was walking into. But I had this opportunity. But again, I had to say yes. So I said yes. Still married. Still had a baby. And I said yes. So I go home. And I say to my husband, I'm going to get my doctorate. And that caused the biggest issue that probably you could ever imagine for a woman to tell her husband that. He was so mad. How could you make such a big decision like this? You're supposed to go to work. Well, long story short, we got a divorce. I had to say yes to that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting. Because when I would call my mother and I'd say, I'm dealing with this, I'm dealing with that, she didn't understand where I was coming from. But it's not because out of malice, but she just did not understand. My mother made it as far as high school. Her guidance counselor in Hartwell, Georgia, told her she'd never be anything, that she'd never make it. She was the oldest of eight kids. So she would never had an opportunity to go to college. But the one thing she wanted for me was to go to college. My father was the same. He graduated from high school, he went off to the military, and he died at 26 from HIV. So he never got to see me or my brother do anything. So the one thing I wanted to do was to move forward. But she did give me that $500 to go file the paperwork with the court to get rid of that guy that I called my husband. So that was great. I did pay her back, by the way. 
So after I do that, now I'm this single parent, nowhere to go, nothing to do. So my daughter and I moved into an apartment complex at Florida State. It was old, it was dusty, but that's all we had. And so we were there, and I matriculated through the program. And then the recession hit. College institutions started slashing instructors left and right. I was an adjunct instructor at the time while going to school full time. I worked at a museum. I worked at another museum full time. And my daughter was always with me in tow, going from here to there to everywhere. So what did I do? I applied for jobs, literally probably 40 jobs at one time. Only one institution called me back. From 40 schools, one institution called me back. So I went to my um, advisor for my master's degree, and I said, hey, I got this opportunity. They called me back for this interview for an assistant professor position. And he looks at me, and he goes, oh, hmm. Well, that's interesting. He said, it'll be good practice for you, but you'll probably never get that job. Now imagine, someone I looked up to said, well, that's good, but you'll be up against people that already have their PhD, but you should go for practice. I said, okay. So again, when people throw money at you and say, well, we'll pay for your flight, and we'll pay for your hotel to come all the way to Tomball, Texas, guess what I did? I said yes. Got on that plane, didn't know anything about Texas besides cowboy boots and belts and shoes and hats <laughs> and starchly white T-shirts. That's all I knew, but I went. I was as nervous as could be, probably more nervous than I am standing up here today. I had a fade, low cut, no hair, but I went in there and did the interview. Flew back home to Tallahassee. A week later, I got another call. Hey, we're interested in you. The president wants to talk. So I was excited. I ran back to the same person who told me that I couldn't do it, and I said, they called me back. And he was just astonished. He was like, wow, OK. Well, you go ahead and do that and let me know what happens. And so I did. I went back. I had an interview. And luckily, the president was a woman. The vice president at the time was another woman. And they kept asking me all these questions. How did you get here? Why did you apply for a college? And I said, to be honest, I applied everywhere. I don't know much about your institution, except for you were one of the 40 on the list that I applied for. And y'all called back. And when you called back, I had to go back in my books and see what is this school that I applied to? And they thought it was funny, but it's exactly what I did. So nonetheless, I was offered the job, and I had $500 in my pocket. I sent my daughter back home to Atlanta, and I drove from Tallahassee to Houston, Texas. And I stayed in an extended value hotel where all kinds of riffraff happens there, if you've ever seen them before. But I was able to purchase my first home at 24. I was able to provide my daughter a life that I wanted her to have because, again, I wanted her to have more than what I had. So we get to Texas. If you've ever been there, it's a very interesting place. They do say everything is bigger in Texas, and it is. The cars are huge. The trucks are huge. I felt like this itty-bitty person in this massive town that I didn't know anything about. My mother was upset with me because she said, now you're moving so much further away. But again, I had to build up enough courage to say, well, this is something that I want to do. I don't want to stay at home. I want to be more than what they said I could be. So I'm going off and I'm doing this. So I did it. But then you find out workplace issues. There's not a class that teaches you anything about dealing with people. Yeah, you take psychology and sociology and those types of things, but there is not a class there's not a workplace issues 101 and how to deal with that person that don't like you 102. There's not a class that tells you that. So you walk in the door, one of the youngest members on the faculty, and I was the only African-American woman that they had ever hired to teach history at this college. So imagine how intimidating that made me feel. Well, I worked there for a year. It was fun. And then they said something about, we're going to have this brand new college that we're going to open. Any takers? So I didn't really care for the environment that I was in. So I said, I'll go. Again, having the courage to say yes. So I went. I was one of two history faculty members. 
And that's when I really stepped up my game and decided that I want to do something more than just teach. So from that moment, I sat back. I was in my own little office. I put all my history pictures up, and I said, I'm really somebody now. Well, then I found out that they wanted something, this, this position called faculty senate president. So this group of people came up to me and they said, oh, we think you would be the best one to do this position. And I said, well, what's that? They said, oh, all you do is just, you know, lead the meeting. You're really a facilitator. You just talk to people. You come up with our agenda, and we run everything else. So I said, okay, I don't have anything else to do. Because, you know, by that time, you know, I would be finished teaching my classes and be back at the bus stop to meet my daughter. Well, little did I know, faculty senate president was a really big deal. I took the position and made friends on one hand and several enemies on the other. But that's okay, because in this process of saying yes, it's all about me right now, because so many other people are going to tell you no. So there was a faction that said, well, she's too young. She can't do it. She just came out of grad school. She hasn't even finished her PhD yet. Why does she need to be in this position? But again, you have to fight your way to say yes. So I did that. Then I became department chair. Then I left that college and went to another one and became a dean. Then I left that college and went to another one and became another dean. And then I made my way here to New York. When I called my mom and said, hey, I'm going, um, to New York this weekend. She said, oh, is it a conference? I was like, yeah, it's a conference. There was no conference up in Syracuse, New York that I could tell her about. The only thing that I had was a job interview. So I called her back when I was offered the job, and I said, I just want to let you know we're going to Syracuse. And she had a fit. And I was already in Texas. She's still in Atlanta, and she had a fit. And I had to sit her down and say, Mom, you have been there with me through it all. From the time that my GPA dropped to a 2.8, to the time that I was evicted out of my apartment because I didn't have enough money to pay for it, to the time that I had to send Lyric back to you because I didn't have enough money to support her, to the time when you told me what happened to my dad, from the time that you told me that you can make it, from the time that you told me that you know, when I earned my PhD and I thought that I wasn't going to get it because I was having some issues, you said keep pushing, have faith, and keep moving on because I was going to quit. And if I would have quit, where would I be today? Sometimes as students, we look at our teachers or our administrators, they're all put together, and we think, well, you've never experienced anything in life. We think that, you know, you don't know what it's like to grow up and not have anything. Don't make those assumptions. Because every person that stands in front of you has had to have a, the courage to say yes. And it's very difficult because you have to go against the grain and go against the mold and chart your own path. You have to go the untraditional route when everybody says, well, you're too young. You can't go that way. Or you're a woman. You're not supposed to be here. I've sat in meetings where I'm the only one. I'm the only African American, or I'm the only woman, or I'm the youngest in the room. But you have to learn to say yes to yourself, because if you don't, then you can likely close the door on an opportunity that will literally change your life. Thank you. <laughs>